On the 17th of November in 1964, a little boy was born in Fosleres to a man named Simon and a woman named Sophie. Little did they know that he would become widely known as the deadliest killer South Africa has ever seen. A little boy named Moses Setole. Moses' father was the only breadwinner, and having to provide for his wife and six children put a lot of stress on their finances. When Moses was ten, his father passed away and left them in dire straits. Undoubtedly, Sophie had contemplated what to do constantly, but in the end, she was left without much choice. She took her six children to a police station and left them there. By the time he was 14, he ran away from the orphanage in search of his mother. He would later claim that during his time in the orphanage, he suffered emotional, physical, and sexual abuse. He was in Durban, but managed to travel all the way back to Johannesburg and even managed to find his mother. But she rejected him once more. Moses' older brother, who lived in Fosleres, was able to take him in, but it wouldn't be long before he lost his job and moved to Vanda. Allegedly, Moses illegally sold this very same house and fled. On the 14th of September in 1987, Satole walked up to 38-year-old Patricia Kamala and introduced himself as Martin. He told Patricia that he had helped two other women to find great jobs, but they never showed up. He then asked Patricia if she would be interested in taking the position. Patricia, who was already looking for work, happily agreed. She agreed to follow him to a train station, where they boarded and traveled to Heldenay Station. He told her that they can walk through a field to get to the premises. But while in the field, he turned on Patricia, undressed her, tied her hands with her bra, and raped her multiple times. Patricia didn't report the event at the time, so it was only discovered much later. But Patricia Kamala would be Moses Hitole's first victim. A little more than a year later, on the 28th of September in 1988, Satole approached another woman, this time referring to himself as Samson. He offered her a great work opportunity, but she was already employed and gave the name of her best friend, Dorcas Kobane. Dorcas met with Satole, and he took her on a train to Cleveland. He led her into a field and went on to rape her as well. When it was over, he tried to have a conversation with her, and even stated that he had a girlfriend named Simon Gile in Fosleres, which turned out to be true. He asked her if they could have sex again. She of course declined, and Satole raped her again. He also attempted to strangle her, but he was interrupted by a man walking through the field and fled. Just like Patricia, Dorcas didn't report the events either. When 17-year-old Simon Gile introduced Moses to her family, she knew him as Martin. Her family was quite fond of the young man. In October of 1988, Moses went to their house and told Lingiwe, Simon Gile's 15-year-old sister, that he was there to pick her up. He took Lingiwe to a train station, where they would travel to Haldenay Station. He then took her to the same field that he had taken his first victim, and raped her as well. Afterwards, he told her that he would kill her if she told anyone. He then took her back home, and she never spoke of the ordeal until nine years later. Moses was getting very comfortable in his ways. Almost a bit too comfortable. In February of 1989, he approached a woman named Boiswa Swaganisa. He introduced himself as Lloyd Thomas, and stated that he could help her find a job in Cleveland. She also followed him all the way to the field, where he raped her as well. But Boiswa would break the cycle. She reported it to the police. However, because he used a fake name, the investigation bared no fruit. In May of 1989, Boiswa saw Moses roaming the streets of Cleveland. She phoned the police, and they arrived within minutes to arrest him. On their way to the police station, Boiswa had to ride in the back of the police van with Moses. She later stated that he told her during their ride, Bitch, I should have killed you when I had the chance. He would continue to claim that he is innocent while serving his sentence, and would later state that he hated black women because he was falsely accused by Boiswa. The fact that he was viciously and constantly sodomized in prison would only increase his hatred. During his time in prison, he met the woman that would become his common-law wife, named Martha. 
who was visiting her brother in the prison. Satola was released in 1993 and started working as a mechanic with his brother-in-law. A few months later, he abandoned his mechanic job, and with his son on the way, he sets off to find a well-paying job. Or at least, that's what he told Martha and her family. In July of 1994, the body of 19-year-old Marina Monama was found in a field in Cleveland. She had also been raped and strangled. Her murder would be among the 38 murders Moses would later be charged with, but it was initially contributed to another man named David Salepi. She disappeared from her home on her way to Pretoria only two days prior to her body being discovered, but her parents only learned of her death four months later. During this time, Satoli was in a relationship with another woman named Amanda Tete. On the 2nd of August 1994, Amanda left the house at around 9 a.m. She told her parents that she was going to pay some bills and then go to a school in Pretoria where she worked as a teacher. She was never seen alive again. After a week following her disappearance, her parents went to John Foster Police Station to report it. The police allegedly told them that they don't possess the necessary stationery to file a missing persons report and that they needed to go to Kruger's Door Police Station. After another week with no news of the case, they returned to Kruger's Door Police Station, only to be told that Amanda's file had been lost. Her parents didn't know it at the time, but Amanda's body had been discovered in a mine dump in Cleveland only four days after she disappeared. She had been raped and strangled with her panties and pantyhose stuffed into her mouth. She was in the mortuary for two months before being buried in an unmarked grave. On the 17th of October in 1994, her father identified her photograph in a newspaper and she was given her name back. Her body was exhumed to give her family the opportunity to have a proper burial. Moses even attended her funeral. During the months from August to October, three more bodies had been found in Cleveland. In September of 1994, the Brixton Murder and Robbery Unit set up an elite task force to investigate the series of murders in Cleveland, as well as the two from Pretoria. The series was investigated under the name The Cleveland Serial Killer, and included 15 victims. Soon after, police received a tip that led to a man named David Salepi. Salepi was arrested on the 15th of December in 1994. According to some sources, Newspaper articles regarding the Cleveland serial killer was found in the trunk of his car when he was arrested. They also stated that some of the victim's blood had been found on his clothes. Police later stated that Salepi admitted to murdering 15 victims in Cleveland as well as Attridgeville. It is also alleged that Salepi told police that he had an accomplice, who he referred to as Mondla and Tito. They later interviewed a man named Mondla, but soon discounted him as a suspect and with it, they also discounted Salepi's accomplice story. Salepi had led police to some of the sites where these brutal acts had taken place. On the 18th of December in 1994, he led police to the site of Amanda Tete's murder, Satole's girlfriend. From the 2nd to the 4th of August in 1994, Amanda's bank card had been used numerous times. CCTV footage along with facial recognition was used to determine that the man at the ATM was David Salepi. While showing police where Amanda's body was found, he told police that he had hidden some of her belongings in a nearby bush. He then asked to be uncuffed so that he could retrieve the bag. The officers obliged and Salepi was uncuffed. He pointed at the bag and as soon as one of the officers bent over to pick it up, Salepi grabbed a stick and hit him over the head and fled. This resulted in Salepi being fatally shot. The Cleveland Serial Killer Task Force was disbanded and the case was closed. However, the relief felt by some people was short-lived, and without warning, the cases of missing persons and the rate at which the bodies were discovered skyrocketed. Join us again for part two, where we'll discuss further developments in the case.